Okay, so we have an exciting um, talk tonight, someone who's written both fiction and nonfiction and can maybe blur the boundaries for us a little bit. And before we get to that, I would like to introduce Professor Jeff Wasserstrom, who's a Chancellor's Professor in the History Department, and he also specializes on China, on things about China and in regard to China, including student protests, including gender, including urban issues, etc. I remember, um, you know, we faculty, we write books, and uh, Professor Wasserstrom has written, uh, co-authored, or co-edited 10 books by my count. Um, so he's written a lot of them. And I remember a long time ago, a colleague from the UK telling me that he'd overheard his daughter talking with her friends, and they were all talking about what their parents did for a living. And she said, well, my dad, who was an academic, writes books, but they're the kind nobody reads. <laughs> and what I want to say about uh, Jeff Wasserstrom's books is that I think they are the kind that people read, and um, including his first book on student protests in 20th century China, The View from Shanghai, up to a recent book, China in the 20th Century, What Everyone Needs to Know. And so if you want to know what you need to know about China in the 21st century, you should read this book, which has also been translated into Turkish, Korean, um, and Chinese, and Indonesian. So a lot of people around the world are reading this book, I think. In addition to writing books, Professor Wasserstrom also is very committed to reaching out beyond the ivory tower, and he frequently has pieces in Time, Newsweek, uh, op-eds in the New York Times and many other places, and he writes for blogs in the Huffington Post, among other places as well. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jeff Wasserstrom. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it actually fits very well to um, introduce Adam Brooks, who I'm really delighted uh, to be here. We've been working him tirelessly. Okay, hold on. We are actually having him Skype this lecture into another class across campus, so long distance learning just to the other side of the park. <laughs> but it fits very much to, um, to introduce Adam after that introduction because um, Adam and I met in the most dramatic situation that I've ever experienced in China. Um, NATO had, was carrying out bombing raids uh, against Serbia to try to push back against ethnic cleansing by Milosevic. And one of those bombs hit the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, killing three uh, Chinese citizens. And there were large protests on the streets of um, Beijing demanding that NATO apologize for this and pushing back against NATO. And so Adam helped me. Uh, we were planning to, to do an interview. He was planning to interview me. He was working for BBC um, at the time. And he was going to interview me about the history of Chinese student protests on an anniversary of some past protests. And then I thought he would want to scuttle the interview based on the fact there was a real news story happening, so you didn't need to talk to a historian. But he nicely said, actually, it would be nice to talk to a historian about what's going on in the streets right now and put it into perspective. And so we watched uh, demonstrations together at this very exciting time, got to hear people say things like, in Chinese, if you're American, we want to kill you, which was a new experience, a novelty. The stakes were very high then. We learned how to say, we are from Australia, <laughs> Wosher Odalia Ren. Um, I foolishly first said, learned how to say, Wosher Diana Da Ren, I'm Canadian, because being an American, we always think we're the center of everything. And I, had to be reminded that Canada is actually part of NATO, so that was the wrong thing to say. But it was very exciting, and he also taught me a lot about communicating with broader audiences, because I'd begun to start doing some writing, um, which did the amazing thing of, for an academic of trying to shrink what you know that is said over 400 pages down to a mere 10 pages, or five pages, or three pages. But he interviewed me for television and tried to say, so figure out, can you say anything that would be worth people remembering in, say, half a minute or a minute? And it was wonderful training that I've always been grateful to, because the first reaction of an academic is always, there's no way I could say anything without the full time, um, as shown by this introduction, which was supposed to be <laughs> half a minute going on and on. But anyway, it was wonderfully. Uh, and then the second time we met, 
after that, after spending time in Beijing in the 6th Iron, was on a panel at an Association for Asian Studies meeting where he did the very nice, uh, very nicely agreed to cross the border from the world of journalism into the world of academics and be part of a panel to talk to a broad spectrum of specialists about how to engage with the media and how he engages with scholarship in doing the research that he does for his reporting. And he talked earlier today at a session on writing novels about how the research he does um, to, to write fiction as well. Um, for studying abroad, um, since I need to make a pitch for that, I didn't actually go to China to study abroad. I ended up going there later. But I went to London to study abroad, which I was joking with Adam, said made it easier for me to understand his accent. So you never know when studying abroad will help you. But actually, studying abroad in England, which was a really lazy thing to do because they speak English or a version of it over there, um, ended up being something that had, has been a gift that's kept giving throughout my life, even though I've gone on to study China, which is totally unlike it. The place in China I study is Shanghai, most. And Shanghai has a bunch of buildings and section that was built when it was partly run by the British. And so having spent time in London actually radically uh, changed the way I wrote about Shanghai and saw Shanghai when I went there. So one of the things about studying abroad is it'll change forever both your connection to one part of the world where you go, but it'll also, in ways you don't realize at the time, change the way you see all parts of the world. All right, I've blathered on enough. Uh, and now I think we're ready at the other end for the Skype. Um, uh, the other reason why I had to talk for a little while was because the Skype at the other end wasn't set up, and now I think it'll be ready. And they can miss me. They hear me all the time in my class over there in Global Crisis. Uh, so Adam Brooks was a BBC correspondent who covered many parts of the world. His first posting was in Indonesia. He later went on to report from Beijing when um, I may have been there during the most dramatic part of my experiences abroad, but I think it was probably not even in the top 10 of his most dramatic places. Because from Beijing, he went to cover uh, Afghanistan when, the war, uh, when war broke out there, invasion. And then he eventually started reporting on some place that's incredibly exotic, more exotic than all of the places I've mentioned that he studied in some ways, and has had as much influence on his thinking about dystopia and spy fiction. He reported on the Pentagon and got to report on Washington, DC, and view it as a foreign reporter, which is also a reminder that every place is foreign uh, to most of the world. He then did a daring thing, daring in a different way than reporting from war zones and trying to cover um, news in a meaningful way. And he does it very, very well through um, often very short form, even though he knows a lot and compresses it down very shortly. He made the daring jump into writing fiction and trying to engage with issues of the contemporary world including China's involvement with different parts of the world through a medium that people really will read and maybe, we're all hoping, eventually be able to see up on big screens even uh, for even the non-readers to be exposed to. His first book, uh, Night Heron, came out um, uh, a year, year ago, year and a half. And to be honest, I read it out of a sense of friendship and duty. I started reading it thinking, you know, this is a friend of mine. He did something really daring. And then I couldn't put it down. And it was just compulsively readable, as well as getting China so right that it brought back um, memories of, of events and meals and conversations I'd had there, even though it was all about things I had, hadn't done. And I wasn't the only one who really loved it. The Economist named it one of its book of the year. He's then followed this up with a second of what will ultimately be a trilogy uh, book, um, Spy Games, which has already been named a fiction book of the year by Kirkus Review, and has, was also just named the, the Times of London, called it its thriller of the month, and wrote a rave review about it as well. So this is somebody who's had an extraordinary takeoff in um, moving from a very successful career in journalism to a very successful career as a spy novelist. And so I think it's, very, uh, it's a real treat for us to have him here. He's here under the auspices of Illuminations, 
and also of international studies and IGARS, which is very pleased about that, and from something called the Forum for the Academy and the Public, which Amy Willans of Literary Journalism directs. And that has done a series of trying to get, break down the wall between serious journalism and other kinds of writing and academic writing. And so keep your eye out for events that are going there. Uh, Google Forum for the Academy and the Public. Um, I'll send the link to the, the class can have it. We're going to have a, a large workshop on freedom of expression and its enemies around the world in uh, late January that um, will include a Skyped in, Googled in, Google Hangout in pre, uh, presentation by Edward Snowden. So it'll be a very special kind of moment on, on Irvine campus. So stay tuned for that. I think mentioning Snowden and the NSA is a perfect lead in to discussion of the dystopian world of uh, surveillance societies and other things from the perspective of a journalist and a spy novelist. Please welcome Adam Brooks. Thank you very much indeed for that fantastic introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for inviting me to wonderful Southern California and to the faculty here at UCI for, for arranging all these wonderful opportunities to speak. My title this afternoon is Dystopian Settings. The term dystopian, uh, according to very cursory research on my part, seems to have been coined by the British economist and social theorist John Stuart Mill. There he is in a speech he made to the British Parliament in 1868. He used it, of course, as a play on the term utopia. For Mill, it meant a state in which life for the individual is so bad as to be, in his word, impracticable. But our understanding of the term is much broader and is associated with lots of very specific themes. Can anybody name that individual? First person to name that individual gets a popsicle. Who is it? Yeah, no, I knew it was Rutger Hauer, but who's the character? <laughs> Roy Batty, thank you very much. The popsicle goes to the lady at the back. Uh, it's a fictional, notional popsicle. Uh, this is Roy Batty in the great dystopian movie Blade Runner, directed by uh, Ridley Scott. Dystopia is primarily a term used uh, to describe settings in literature. The setting is always characterized by human misery or by unthinking or forced compliance with an oppressive state or a corporate entity, uh, often by uh, technology employed in the service of oppression, by degradation, dehumanization, powerlessness, pollution, and surveillance. These imagined dystopian worlds are often set in the future, like uh, like Blade Runner, they often serve the literary purpose of warning us what might happen to us if a current set of trends or circumstances in the real world uh, persist and expand into the future. If we think of great dystopian novels of the 20th century, we're obviously thinking about Orwell's 1984, Huxley's Brave New World, and Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 which variously warned of totalitarianism and technology as a tool of social control and mass surveillance and medicine and biotechnology as roads leading to a dystopian future. <coughs> My own favorite dystopian future is depicted in William Gibson's 1984 novel, Neuromancer, a fabulous piece of science fiction that imagines a digital universe in which vast corporate galaxies are protected by encryption known as ICE. Techno-augmented hackers enter the cyber domain by uploading their consciousness to the net. And they attempt to penetrate these corporate galaxies, fighting their way through the ICE. 30 years ago, Gibson imagined the growth of a dystopian cyberverse with a precision that is just haunting. And while I'd say his dystopian warnings are sort of unspecific, the world he presents is warning enough in itself, though it looks kind of exciting too. And that's part of the lure of these imagined dystopian worlds, which are, of course, very popular in fiction and film today. Uh, you can see why. 
there's Katniss, obviously. The dystopian world provides a perfect backdrop against which the hero can emerge, thus generating conflict, in this case, Katniss versus dystopia in the Hunger Games series. And conflict, injecting conflict into story, is the lifeblood of all fiction writing. So if you are a writer and you're interested in imagining a dystopian world as a means to generate conflict and suspense and to warn the reader in some way, where would you be looking today? What facets of the world we inhabit now would you hold up and say to the reader, look, if this goes on, what sort of a place are we going to live in in the future? What might the world become? Well, the list is long, isn't it? Climate change, pollution, global inequality, pandemics, migration, artificial intelligence that seeks to replace the, na the need for humans. The list of potential dystopian futures is, is long. But I'm going to ask you to think about two related themes that harbour the possibility of the dystopian. These are themes I'm very interested in and themes that dominate uh, my, my uh, attempts to write fiction. They're themes we're all familiar with, uh, but they're themes that might seem quite distant to most of us in terms of our daily felt lived experience. They are espionage and surveillance. In the two novels that I've published so far, and the third I'm now attempting to write, I look at these themes of espionage and surveillance through the frame of our geopolitical relationship with China. Espionage has dystopian possibilities for me because it evokes the sense that things are not as they seem. People are not who you think they are. Spies are operatives of shadowy bureaucracies pretending to lead lives that you understand, but are actually following another set of rules altogether. The notion of espionage happening around us right now, right here in California today, is disorienting. It leads us to question what we think we know, to see the possibility of betrayal in the most innocent encounters. It breaks bonds of trust. It breaks the social contract. We know espionage can wreak havoc, though the full extent of the damage may be hidden from us. Linked to espionage is, of course, surveillance, which clearly has great dystopian possibilities. Surveillance induces a particular kind of claustrophobia, a sense of powerlessness, a sense that nothing you do is private, particularly when it's conducted in a way that may seek to control you, to prevent you from acting in non-sanctioned ways, to compile a record of your activities that may be used against you in the future. Just the thought of surveillance will make you change your behaviour. Let's take a quick look at espionage first in a bit more detail, as it exists in the world today. Espionage is often used as a, as a catch-all term for spying, but traditionally it emphasises the use of human beings as spies, as opposed to eavesdropping or taking pictures from satellites. Espionage emphasises what those in the business call human intelligence, or humint, as they abbreviate it to. Abbreviate it to. Usually, human gathering implies that an intelligence agency, maybe the CIA or Britain's SIS, Secret Intelligence Service, or Russia's SVR, or China's MSS, or Ethiopia's NISS, choose one, they all do it much the same way. Um, such an agency employs a case officer to go out in secret and recruit an agent. The agents are people who might work in the government of another country, or in a terrorist network, or in a corporation, and who are in possession of privileged information. The case officer's job is to persuade the putative agent to betray the trust placed in them and hand over the information. That's the central act of traditional espionage. Today we're faced with a whole new set of possibilities in the form, of course, of cyber espionage. This describes the act of hacking into a target computer network with the aim of remaining undiscovered and of stealing information. Cyber espionage is distinct from hacking for activist purposes or for theatre, and it's also distinct from cyber warfare, the act of destroying an adversary's infrastructure through cyber attack on an adversary's network. Parenthetically here, traditional espionage 
is great fodder for the fiction writer. Cyber espionage has spy fiction writers banging their heads against the wall. How on earth do you make a guy at a computer keyboard dramatic and suspenseful? It's a nightmarishly difficult thing to do. Some have tried, but few have yet succeeded. Now, there's a popular belief that traditional espionage, that gathering of humans between the case officer, the agent runner, and the agent, was essentially a Cold War activity. It was carried on on the dank streets of Berlin and Vienna and Helsinki, uh, as beautifully portrayed in the novels of John le Carré. And when the Cold War ended, it sort of stopped. The sort of spying ceased to be a significant field of endeavor for governments, and it's been completely supplanted by cyber espionage. Lucky for spy novelists, that view, I can tell you, is completely mistaken. Meet Moore High Long. In 2011, Moore High Long was found by a security guard in a field outside Ames, Iowa. He was kneeling in the dirt, digging up corn seedlings. When confronted, he ran away to a car where another man was waiting. He jumped in and the two of them sped away. The FBI put the men under surveillance, bugged their car, and tracked their movements for two and a half years. Moore was found to be an executive of the Beijing Da Beinong Industrial Feed Company. The field he was found in contained experimental strains of corn, some of them genetically modified by corporations like Monsanto and DuPont. The samples that Moore was uh, taking, was stealing, were sent back to China, hidden in boxes of Orville Redenbacher microwave popcorn. The surveillance, the FBI surveillance in the end, led to the prosecution of seven people. The FBI had found a spy ring, tasked with acquiring cutting-edge agricultural technology from the United States. If China could acquire and reverse engineer these GMO seed varieties, it would save years and many millions of dollars in research and development. But who were they tasked by? Was this an operation just run by a Chinese seed company, a little piece of industrial espionage, or was it something larger, perhaps run with the backing of the Chinese state? We don't know the answer to that, and I've been unable to find out, and I'm not sure the FBI even knows. On the surface, it all looks a bit clunky, doesn't it? It looks like a, a rather naive and, and, and clunky piece of industrial spying. But think for a moment about climate change, about water shortage, resource scarcity, about food security for China's vast population. China must feed 20% of the world's population on 8% of the world's arable land. Food imports are essential to China's security, while the United States dominates the international market in seed corn. No wonder China wants to develop its own varieties of high-yield, drought-resistant, pest-resistant corn, and it wants to do them quickly. It's a matter of national security for China. More high longs kneeling in an Iowa field digging up corn plants suddenly starts to look like a rather serious piece of strategic espionage. Think, too, of the dystopian themes running through this story. The Chinese state fears that long-term food shortage, drought, instability, and overpopulation may be an inevitable part of its future, and it is calibrating its espionage operations to take that into account. Or consider Chi Mac. He started spying for China in Hong Kong in the 1970s. He used to watch Hong Kong Harbor and note down which United States Navy ships were coming and going. Later, he came here to California, and he got a job at Power Paragon, a defense company just up the road in Anaheim. When FBI agents searched his house clandestinely in 2007, they reportedly found stacks of documents relating to US naval technology, highly classified documents, including uh, documents, for example, describing the cloaking technology on the propellers on uh, Virginia-class submarines. Chi Mac ran a small spy ring using his relatives as couriers. They would take CD-ROMs loaded with valuable documents back to China for him. Chi Mac was sentenced to 24 years in prison. The FBI believes that he was planted by Chinese intelligence two decades previously to spy on the US defense industry, though I think this has never been conclusively proven. 
Lastly, and this is where I'll mention, you know, in the spirit of International Education Week, consider Glenn Shriver. A college student from Virginia, Shriver spent his junior year studying abroad at East China Normal University in Shanghai, learning Chinese. Admirable, by the way, an admirable thing to do. Just make sure you don't do what Glenn Shriver did. <laughs> While he was there, he answered an advertisement in a newspaper offering 120 US dollars for papers or essays about US-China relations. Short of cash, Shriver responded, the organizers of the competition took an interest in him, befriended him, and suggested he had a great future in US-China relations, and perhaps he might like to join the US Foreign Service. They offered to pay his expenses while he studied up for the exams. Shriver accepted their offer, spent a few months cramming for the Foreign Service exams, but failed twice in the exam itself. His Chinese, sponsored, his Chinese sponsors suggested that he then try to get on recruitment track, not for the Foreign Service, but for CIA. Again, Shriver accepted their suggestion and applied to, to CIA. By now, he had taken $70,000 from his new Chinese friends. CIA was wise to what he was doing. We don't know how. It's never been uh, revealed how CIA was tipped off. Shriver turned up at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia for his, ex his, his interviews and his polygraph, his lie detector test. Uh, he failed the polygraph. He, he walked out of Langley and was arrested trying to board a flight out of the United States to South Korea. He was sentenced in 2011 to four years in prison, which he served in Elkhart, Indiana. He's just getting out around now. If you're interested in this case, the FBI made a, made a short movie about it, a dramatization. It's called Game of Pawns. It's available on the internet. It's on the FBI's website. And it's exactly how you would imagine a feature film made by the FBI would look. <laughs> it's, it's really, really good. I highly recommend it. Go take a look at it. Game of Pawns. It's on YouTube as well. Now, none of this kind of on first glimpse, especially poor old Glenn Shriver's story, looks or feels very dystopian, does it? But consider for a minute how many people, how many resources of the state are brought to bear over decades running a deep, long-term espionage penetration of CIA. The Shriver case has, as far as I can tell, generated real alarm in Washington, D.C. Counterintelligence officers there believe that if Chinese intelligence really was trying to penetrate CIA with a long-term deep cover agent in Glenn Shriver, then they will have tried with other people too. But as far as we know, no one else has yet been found. One FBI official that I talked to said that he was confident, and he, tapping into our theme again, that American students studying in China were regularly being targeted by Chinese intelligence. So guys, go and study abroad, learn Chinese. It's a fabulous thing to do. It's why I did it, a lot of us did it. Just make sure that you're not recruited by the Ministry of State Security as a long-term penetration agent while you're there, okay? In case after case, it's become clear that uh, Chinese human intelligence operations are very active in the US. Many cases, there are so many, many cases don't even make the newspapers anymore. Cyber espionage against the United States, conducted by China and many other countries, uh, is even more active. Famously, China is, is said in Washington to have stolen the design of the W88 miniaturized thermonuclear warhead. That's the warhead that the United States uses on its intercontinental ballistic missiles, the Trident missile. Uh, I don't think the FBI has ever figured out how that happened, how the design got stolen, but a computer is thought to have been involved in some way. It's something about digital leakage, whether it was somebody with a memory stick downloading blueprints or whether it was a hack. Uh, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure the FBI does either. Equally famously, blueprints for important parts of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter 
the United States' latest uh, uh, top-line fighter bomber, which is just coming into service now, have also been stolen by China. The FBI knows that because a Chinese walk-in and an, an agent who approached the FBI uh, handed over Chinese materials, which indicated that the Chinese were in possessions of top-secret F-35 uh, design blueprints. That uh, is thought to have been a hack uh, into uh, Northrop Grumman, the defense contractor. So now the Chinese are very busy here. What about us? How do we spy on China? It's much harder to get a sense of that, not least because espionage trials in China are carried on in secret. And frequently, espionage trials are actually dressed up as corruption trials. But now and again, we get a little glimpse of how Western intelligence spies on China and just how huge the Western attempt to infiltrate China actually is. In May this year, according to reports in Chinese state media, a man named Li, that's, we only have a surname, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for espionage. The case was broken by the uh, 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 Guanju, the state security bureau in Guangdong. Li had reportedly struck up a friendship online with a man who called himself Feiger, which means flying brother. Feiger reportedly paid Li over several years to gather and forward on military publications from libraries and online bookstores, and to hang out in chat rooms on the Chinese net frequented by military officers and military enthusiasts. The state security investigation reportedly turned up 40 more individuals across China who had been recruited to do the same thing online by this guy, Fei Ge. Fei Ge said the People's Daily was working for a foreign intelligence agency, but we don't know which one. They wouldn't tell us who it was. Most cases that we read about in the Chinese press have an online component to them, suggesting uh, that the digital Chinese state is a very, very leaky place these days. But who was Fei Ge? Some junior officer sitting in a cubicle at Langley, or maybe at Vauxhall Cross in London, the headquarters of SIS, or maybe in Tokyo or Paris, we don't know. Then, there was this guy. General Jin Yi Nan of China's National Defense University. In 2011, General Jin gave a closed door talk at a conference. In it, he gave details of eight very serious espionage cases in China, some of which we had no idea about. Predictably, a video of the speech turned up on the Chinese video sharing site Tudou.com, and from there it made its way to YouTube. He talked about, he told us for the first time about a guy called Kang Er Sin, a member of the Communist Party Central Committee in China, who sold nuclear secrets to an unnamed foreign intelligence agency. He told us about the Air Force attaché in Tokyo, a guy called Wang Qingjian, who planted listening devices inside China's embassy in Tokyo for Japanese intelligence. And he told us about another Air Force officer, Jia Shu Ting, who, angry at being passed over for promotion, loaded USB sticks with classified documents of Chinese military networks, stuck them up his own rectum, and smuggled them out to Hong Kong, where he handed them over to a case officer from another unnamed Western intelligence agency, which we think was CIA. Jin confirmed, too, that the Chinese ambassador to South Korea, Lee Bin, who was actually char charged with corruption a few years ago, was, in fact, uh, uh, charged with espionage in a secret trial. And he was found guilty of passing state secrets to South Korean intelligence. Very occasionally, we get hints that the Chinese Communist Party and its security apparatus are penetrated at very high level by Western spy agencies. In May 2012, Reuters news agency reported that an official here at the Ministry of State Security in Beijing had been arrested for spying for CIA. That was all we ever found out. No further details. If you ask people in Washington, occasionally you'll get a knowing nod, but not much more. So the espionage war between China and the West is very, very real. And it's very active right here in California. From the big defense companies around San Diego, through the university campuses, up to Silicon Valley and Lawrence Livermore, people are spying. 
They're loading proprietary information onto memory sticks, handing them to case officers, or they're leaving them in digital dead drops deep in the Tor network, in the dark net. Right now, FBI counterintelligence teams out of the LA field office are working the streets in, in these cities, reading emails, tapping phones all the way up and down the coast. You just can't see it. This evinces in me a powerful sense of the dystopian because it, of the way it suggests that our view of the world is actually partial. Vast areas of understanding, vast government projects are closed to us. They're completely shut off from us. All of which brings me uh, to surveillance. China's often called a surveillance state because of the very intense monitoring of its own citizens and of foreigners. And it's a very strange moment when, as a journalist in China, you realize that you really are being followed. You're not being fanciful. You're not being paranoid. It really is happening. And they really are listening to your phone calls. And they really are uh, reading your emails and, 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 and tapping your, your bureau. Much of our spying against China, however, is actually done by surveillance on a vast, grand scale. Aircraft, like EP3s, the Orion EP3, loaded with monitoring equipment run by uh, the Navy uh, and the Air Force and the National Security Agency, loiter off China's coast for days and weeks at a time, sucking signals out of the air. U.S. Navy vessels overtly and covertly linger just outside China's territorial waters, listening, watching, <laughs> tracking. The U.S. Navy has submarines, notably the USS Annapolis, whose job it is to stay silently submerged and to carry out specific intelligence and surveillance missions. The satellites run by the most secretive of all the U.S. intelligence agencies. Can anybody name it? Anybody know the name? of the most secretive agency that runs US spy satellites? Nobody? National Close, but no cigar. <laughs> it's actually the National Reconnaissance Office. It's the NRO. The images that are brought down by the NRO then go to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in Chantilly, Virginia, where they are analyzed and turned into finished intelligence. There are 17 agencies in Washington that have an intelligence function that make up what's called the intelligence community. 17. The bulk of the digital and communication surveillance effort against China is, of course, run by the National Security Agency, the NSA, often referred to in, in Washington as no such agency. You must have heard that joke before. Uh, in coordination with multiple others, including the military, the CIA, and crucially, the private sector. Now, the NSA documents leaked by Edward Snowden <coughs> give us a glimpse of NSA's effort against China. There may well be people who've done much more work than I have on trying to understand these documents, so I welcome your contributions and, and, and corrections if there are people who've spent a lot of time with these documents. Um, there's one of the slides that Snowden leaked to Glenn Greenwald in a program run by the NSA known as Shot Giant, the NSA penetrated China's largest telecoms manufacturer and provider, Huawei Corporation, reportedly obtaining knowledge of the company's worldwide networks and even source codes for Huawei technology, which is used all over the world. So not only was the NSA finding out about Huawei and about Huawei's possible links to the Chinese military and to the Communist Party and the Chinese intelligence establishment, and finding out about Chinese telecommunications backbone, it may also have been finding ways into other countries' networks, countries where Huawei technology was being used. The NSA appears to have been putting back doors in Huawei technology that was finding its way all over the world. The NSA, server, uh, NSA targeted the servers at Tsinghua University in Beijing, the country's top technology and engineering university, which has close links to the party and defense establishments. So academia uh, is, is a target for US and European spying too, we know that. And the NSA and Britain's GCHQ mined Chinese text messages and they targeted PACnet, 
which is a corporation managing a huge Asian fiber optic network over which a, an enormous amount of Asian internet traffic moves. I think it's fair to assume they did a lot besides that too. Now, we knew that the world's intelligence agencies, especially NSA and GCHQ, have been very active in intercepting communications for decades. But Snowden gave us a sense, you know, love the guy or loathe the guy, and I personally feel very ambivalent about him. Uh, he gave us a sense of how the operations of these intelligence agencies are morphing into something much larger, nothing less than an attempt at total dominance of the electromagnetic spectrum and of the new contested cyber domain. And if you hang out in Washington at all, and if you hang out in the Pentagon, and if you go to open unclassified panels, panels in Washington, you will hear that kind of language employed quite regularly. Military officers and intelligence agency people talking about total domination of the electromagnetic spectrum with all the implications uh, uh, of that. And it's important to understand that we're only just at the beginning of this process. We're only just witnessing the birth of these, these new worlds. The American admiral, uh, James Stavridis, just retired, likes to say that with regard to cyber, the cyber domain, we are, he says, standing on the beach at Kitty Hawk. He's alluding to the moment that the Wright brothers watched their rickety hand-built aircraft fly for the first time along that beach in North Carolina, and their realization that controlled powered flight was possible, and their understanding that thereby man was entering a whole new domain, domain of the air. Since then, we've entered the domain of space. Today, we are just entering the domain of cyber. Snowden has also made me think about the nature of our contract with the state. What expectations, obviously, can we have of privacy in a digital world? What protections from surveillance can we expect or hope for? What expectations should we have of surveillance conducted in the name of national security? The last week's events in Paris, of course, make us examine that question anew. And why are we so willing to allow ourselves to be surveilled by corporations? Now, the spy novel is a great place to talk about these things. It's a great vehicle for imagining worlds in which espionage and surveillance are core levers of economic and political power. It's a great vehicle for imagining the changing nature of loyalty and betrayal. It's a great place for considering digital dystopia. Those are mine. This is the second novel I wrote. Those are the three different covers that it's gone out under so far. In my two published novels, uh, Night Heron and this one, Spy Games, I've imagined several long, complex operations run by British intelligence to spy on China. I've tried to imagine how one might operate as a spy in China today in a place where the streets and the digital medium are saturated with surveillance. My characters encounter surveillance not in an imagined dystopian future, but in a quotidian dystopian now. Their world is one in which espionage is banal, grubby, and dangerous, and one where the spy leaves a digital spore, a digital trail, wherever he or she goes, simply as a byproduct of living. My characters are coming to internalize the idea that as we all live and move through time and space and culture, we also now move all the time through a digital medium. While rarely breaking into full-fledged dystopia, my spy stories play with the notion that dystopia is already here, lurking in the malware on your cell phone, pulsing through the surveillance networks that now surround us, flickering in the fiber optic cables that enshroud us. It's in the sense that even as the world's information resides at our fingertips, the world feels as if it's receding from us. It's in the sense that things and people are perhaps not what they seem to be. It's dystopia in a line of code, or in an electromagnetic signature, or as a flicker in the corner of your eye. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>